The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Hi, my name is David Marks. We're here in Northern California, sunny California, where I've got my woodworking school. We teach classes on a variety of woodworking subjects as well as bowl turning. So for today, I'd like to show you how to turn a bowl. I'm gonna grab this uh, beautiful old piece of olive wood here. This is a really fine piece of European olive wood. It's got some bark inclusions, but I'll show you what I'm gonna to do to cut out around those defects and hopefully get a nice uh, small bowl or sort of a hollow form out of this piece of olive wood. I'm using a compass to draw a six inch diameter circle on the olive wood. The bandsaw is the most efficient tool for trimming the blank to size. Make sure you use a push stick to keep your fingers away from the blade. Well, I've discovered more cracks inside the wood, but I'll see if I can remove it on the lathe. I'm lining up the point of the live center with the center mark left by the compass. Now I'm lining up the spur drive on the other side. Sharpening begins with using a diamond wheel dresser to flatten the 80 grit wheel. I like using a felt tip black marker to draw some lines on the bevel. That way you know exactly what metal you've removed when you start to sharpen. I recommend using Stu Batty's platform sharpening technique. Draw lines on the platform at 40 degrees using a protractor. Then set the angle of the platform to grind a 40 degree angle on the bevel or nose of the gouge. And then grind the wing straight and round the nose. I'm using a push cut to rough out the stock. Well, it turns out that that bark inclusion is pretty deep, as well as these cracks. I could fill it with black epoxy, but for now, let's move on to a different piece of wood. I found a really nice piece of maple burl that we can use instead. By offsetting the blank, I can better balance the natural edge on the top. This piece of maple burl is about six years old and has gotten pretty dry and hard. I have the thumb of my left hand across the flute of my half inch bowl gouge, applying pressure down to the tool rest as my right hand pushes the gouge towards the headstock. You can also use the gouge on its side and scrape with the wings. This is a square carbide cutter from the Easy Wood Tool Company. This round carbide cutter from Easy Wood Tools is yet another way to shape a bowl. Here I'm using a 3 8 inch bowl gouge to shape a tenon. The point tool is excellent for creating a crisp dovetail on the tenon. It's critical to have a flat shoulder in contact with the top of the jaws. Make sure there are no gaps and that you can't fit a piece of paper between the jaws and the shoulder. The tailstock can help apply pressure as you're tightening up the jaws. I think a raised band would be a nice detail for this bowl, so I'm using some chalk to lay it out. It needs to be placed just below the lowest section of the natural edge. For natural edge bowls, Always cut from the outside in so as not to damage the edge. The point tool is great for defining bands and beads. Here I begin with the flute open, maintaining bevel contact, and close the flute 
as I meet the band. I'm using a parting tool to define the bottom of the bowl. I've also left some wood over the jaws to protect them. With the gouge on its side, you can safely use the wings to shape and blend the curves. Another feature of the point tool is that you can use all three edges at a 45 degree angle for shear scraping. Final smoothing of the surface is done with sandpaper. This is some foam back 120 grit. Here's a technique that I use for blending curves and making furniture. I'm attaching some 120 grit sandpaper with double stick tape to a piece of 1 8 inch thick bending plywood. The plywood conforms to the curve without rounding over the low spots. A foam pad would round over the natural edges. I'm using a drill to remove the center. Yeah, I'm looking kind of bouncy here. The easy wood tool, this is the CIO round carbide cutter, makes short work out of removing the bulk of the wood. You can move the tool left to right or right to left. The main thing is to keep it flat on the tool rest with the cutting edge at center. After removing some of the bulk from the center, I'm using a sharp 3 8 inch bowl gouge for my finishing cuts near the natural edge. The nose of the gouge slices the wood as the wings peel, producing a very clean surface. Always divide your attention, placing some awareness of how close your hands are to that very sharp spinning natural edge. And don't forget to measure for the bottom of the bowl. Back to the carbide cutter to remove the rest of the wood. Scrapers are a much easier way to shape a curve. Although on a dry piece of maple burl, which has end grain going in all directions, you can end up with a lot of torn fiber. Rotating the cutter to a fresh, sharp edge is a good method for cleaning up the surface. At this stage, take slow, light passes. Well, looks like my knuckle got a little too close to the edge. I have found that the best way to blend the inside curves of a bowl is to attach some sandpaper to a very thin piece of wood with double stick tape and use a padded stick to reach inside and press it down until it conforms to those curves and then move it back and forth to sand out those ridges and blend it to a nice uniform curve. Well, at this point, I'm not finished, but I've got some more sanding to do. And essentially, I'm kind of out of time. Uh, my friend Mark has got to catch a plane. So uh, I just want to give you a general idea of how this thing would go together and how we, we would finish off the bottom. So essentially, the procedure that I would follow is to finish sanding the inside. I generally like to sand the entire piece to 320 and then from there go to a hand rubbed oil finish, essentially a uh, thinned down wiping varnish. And I, I tend to do my finishes off the lathe. Now, in terms of uh, turning the bottom, uh, typically, typically what I like to do is to reverse mount it so I can get ac access to the bottom and turn it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I would normally do is to make a jam chuck, especially with a piece, piece like this because of that natural edge. So you can see that this natural edge would make it difficult to, uh, to reverse mount it. But because I put this, this band on here, uh, what I could do is I could make a jam chuck similar to this, and there would be a face plate on this side. What I would do is I'd, I'd turn a block of wood that would be appropriate for this piece, and essentially the band, this band, would reference up against that edge. So it would fit inside of that, um, you know, this jam chuck. <clears throat> this edge would fit up against this edge, 
And then I could bring up the tailstock, bring up the tailstock. I still have my center, which is important. That way I can get back onto that axis point. So I'd be centered, I could come back in here and I could turn the bottom. And uh, I think we've got uh, a really nice form there. I'm, I'm quite happy with the way that turned out. And by the time this is sanded to 320 and oiled, it's gonna, gonna be a beautiful piece. So at this point, I'd like to show you what the bottom of, of some of my turn pieces look like because it's really important to finish them off on the bottom. So let's head over to the workbench and I'll show you what some of those look like. So here's the piece that we just turned. And uh, what I want to do is to kind of round the bottom a bit more and create a, uh, a nice detail on the bottom. In order to do that, you have to reverse turn it. But the advantages are that you really end up with some, some nice shapes here. Uh, actually, here's a, a hollow vessel that's still a work in progress. This is out of the same wood, some maple burl. And with this one, I bleached it because I wanted to uh, lighten the color a bit. But you can see on the bottom that I've uh, reverse mounted it and turned it, and you can get some really fine details in there. And it just adds to the overall feel of the piece. Here's another one that I've turned. Now this is uh, one that I've done with my gilded patination finishes, or you know, silver leaf with patinas on it. And again, um, I like to put a little groove in there. I also am concerned about the shape because I want that rounded form to sort of round down into that horizontal plane and have that foot kind of disappear. This is uh, an older piece here. This is also out of some, uh, this is some quilted maple. And with this one, it's got sort of an, an OG curve on the bottom shape. And then uh, this, this inset ring here. And just some more details in the center, just again adds to the piece. I like this foot. I, I slightly cut it in a little bit so that when it sits on the table, it's sitting flat. It's got a good solid foundation there. Here's, a, uh, here's one that I just finished out of Koa. So Koa is a beautiful wood, love Koa. It has a lot of warmth and uh, wonderful figure to it. A little bit of black palm end grain for some details on this band. And then uh, again, my, my silver leaf and patina finish on the bottom. And you can see that I did the detail here, made a, a foot so it has a flat spot to rest on, but it's relieved in the center. And that way um, it's always resting on that outer rim. So when it sits on a horizontal surface, you can see that the curves, they seem to flow together. I don't want it to end abruptly into a horizontal plane. And this last one I'll show you is kind of tricky. Uh, this is a two-piece construction with curly co on the top. And then I'm using poplar on the bottom as a uh, canvas for my patina finishes. This one I've done with copper leaf, and I've developed a technique for doing these uh, gold leafed leaves on here. And then on the bottom of this, again, it's rounding down, so it disappears into that horizontal plane and a couple of grooves on the bottom there. So that's pretty much it. And um, yeah, I'm quite happy with the form. I think by the time I've finished off the bottom, um, all this tenon stock will be cut away and it'll be sort of rounding into the, uh, into the table and whoops, kind of looking like this. So once again, my name is David Marks. I've got a school here in Santa Rosa, Northern California. And check out our website. We've got a lot of classes, classes on, on marquetry, classes on inlay. We have a five-day class, hands-on class on finishing, a uh, five-day hands-on class on bowl turning, as well as learning how to do hollow vessels with these patina finishes. So check out my website. It's djmarks.com. Thanks for watching and hope to see you soon.